A lot of interest in microgrids recently. The microgrid is just a smaller power grid, maybe at the community or even at the neighborhood level. The idea is that it can use wind, solar, and uh, battery resources to lower costs, increase resiliency. So I'm going to talk to Dr. Uh, Fezia Shai Nyazan uh, from Simon Fraser University about a paper she re recently wrote. So welcome to the interview. Hi, Mark. It's great to be here. Well, why don't we start with an overview of your paper, please? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, there's a great interest in the last couple of decades on the mini grid and the renewable energy, um, mostly from the point of view of reducing the um, carbon emissions and achieving towards a cleaner energy. But then we realized that for certain communities, the remote communities, these uh, mini grids, renewable mini grids can be the only option to have safe access energy uh, because they are far located from the central mini grids. Um, so it was an interesting topic for sure. Uh, but then a quick look into this problem will reveal that most of these projects uh, within very short amount of time after their installation as short as six months they become uh, abandoned by the local communities. And we were interested in what could be the certain reasons of these abandonment. Yeah, that's, a, that's really intriguing because you would think that the communities would see this as a great opportunity. Maybe they did at the beginning. What were some of the reasons why they abandoned the projects? Um, so the reasons can be uh, classified under many groups, but I think the most emerging theme was the lack of community involvement or community-centered even um, uh, applications. So in certain cases, the projects have been developed from a top-down approach in the sense that the government is very enthusiastic about uh, providing energy to all of their residents. And they just decided to install these projects for the remote communities as it wasn't possible for them to connect it to the central grid. And they say that, so here's a solar project for your community, start using it. Uh, but they never consulted with the community about their demand uh, patterns, about their uh, potential use for the energy. Are they gonna use it for cooking, for agriculture purposes, for uh, electrical appliances? Do they even have electrical appliances? And then um, without this consultation, usually the supply and demand doesn't match. And also in certain cases, even though there is a demand, uh, culture, it's not culturally appropriate. Um, or the site selection was not uh, ideal for the community. So lack of this uh, dialogue with the community is one of the most emerging themes that we observed. Now, back when I was in graduate school in the mid 1980s, uh, I read a lot of uh, literature on the green revolution and the failure uh, in many cases, because essentially the, you know, the, the Western nations thought it would be great if farmers in Latin America, for instance, had tractors and combines, and then they would be going from, you know, uh, oxen to tractors. And there was no infrastructure, there were no parts, there wasn't the culture, there wasn't the expertise, they couldn't repair them, on and on and on. And eventually a lot of these projects failed. And it kind of sounds like we're repeating the same mistakes over, you know, 35, 40 years later. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, and it's a great segue to the second point I think I want to mention. The uh, local expertise or the availability of the um, maintenance people or the spare parts was another lacking part. So even if the system is initially very well adopted uh, by the community, Sometimes even the tiniest uh, problems happening in the system, if it cannot be maintained um, fast enough, then the community started to rely on their previous sources of generation and then they abandon the system. So any project that doesn't have a component of local uh, capacity building in the sense that at least for the maintaining of the services or store some spare parts in a nearby location are also doomed to fail. Is there a recognition by governments, planning authorities in these countries that have they learned this lesson or have they not learned it and it looks like we're doomed to repeat it again and again? That is a very tough question in the sense that it is very hard to generalize. There are so many countries and so many initiatives um, 
mini grid energy alliances are being formed um, day to, on a day-to-day -day basis. It is very hard to sum them up in one sentence. Um, but we see in certain countries, uh, there is this um, pace towards the uh, community involvement or community-centered projects happening. And luckily, Canada is one of them. Uh, there are also very great examples from Bangladesh and India. Um, but still, there are significant gaps in the legislature, in the um, licenses and permits. How can they be obtained by, for example, the private investors so that they can actually um, start building these projects uh, are still lacking. So I am not an expert on energy law, but I am sure there are um, great needs or gaps in the literature that we need to come up with a uniform mini grid energy law in all these contexts. I know when you, if you look at the uh, publications put out by the International Energy Agency, and they talk about the tremendous, like literally trillions of dollars that need to be invested in electricity systems around the world by, by 2050. And it almost seems like from what I'm, uh, as I'm listening to you, uh, that public money might be better spent in training, capacity building, uh, on those kinds of soft skills, uh, and which then sets the stage for private capital to come in, invest in the generation and the grid itself and batteries and, and all of that. It, it, what, what do you think of that idea? Um, in our study, we have looked at different ownership and funding uh, structures of these mini grids. Uh, we had in our data set, we had uh, public invested projects, private invested projects, public private partnerships and community invested projects. Uh, and we realized that um, very interestingly, just as you said, uh, public sector or public funded projects are usually the least cost effective in the sense that we saw a significant cost reduction in uh, private sector projects. Uh, but this result comes with a um, disclaimer because private sector might have chair picking the projects that would be eventually uh, profitable so that there can be a self-selection bias. Um, but uh, the communities, uh, I'm sorry, the public uh, funders uh, can, and they are currently doing it that, that way too, uh, can support some grants to the communities or can um, act, uh, actually provide certain incentives to the private sector, uh, but not fully, um, you know, overbearing the total capital costs, uh, which usually um, accumulates millions of dollars, even for a very small project, such as um, empowering 200 people community. What were some of the countries that, um that where the projects were located that you studied. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious uh, to because we're the idea, I, I've heard the idea floated that using the example of Africa, where instead of bringing in a, a, a telephone, a telecommunication system, they kind of skipped that stage of telecommunications development, went right to cellular and mm -hmm. And so they avoided all the old legacy costs and, and problems. And it, and it has occurred to me, and I've heard it argued, that with solar, wind, and, and batteries and microgrids could do the same thing in, in some countries. And it doesn't seem like we're having quite the same success. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a yes and no in the sense that, yes, there's like the largest um, proportion of the population that is lacking uh, electricity access is residing in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, in terms of connecting them to the uh, electricity systems through mini grids has a greater potential in that sense. So they can skip the you know, central grid connection directly to the uh, mini grid powered communities, but also the uh, most striking uh, figures were also coming from sub-Saharan Africa in the sense that in one particular study, 60% of these projects that are installed in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has failed. So uh, yes, there is a great potential uh, for Africa, but then the failure rate was also uh, significantly higher than the rest of the world. Well, great. Thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you.